work and uh, those who are using the library, including the students who created the project and the students um, and visitors to the department. So the word alchemy conjures the seemingly magical process of material transformation. And it's in this spirit that we undertook this exploration of this territory between clay and glaze and the hunt for unusual ceramic materials. So rather than beginning with specific calculations, we began with materials that had some desirable qualities and tried to morph them into new materials that could behave differently. Our guiding principle was to stay open to results. We felt that if we were certain about what we were looking for, we may not be as open to the possibilities that would arise in the testing process. And what I'd like to share with you today is this approach. We've set up a website here, and there are some specific recipes for the five areas we developed in the project. Um, the first uh, on the left here is the introduction, and the other images are from the five categories. Um, but moreover, there are some uh, guidelines um, and general trends rather than specific recipes that you might use to adapt your own materials rather than uh, following a specific formula. So I will not get very technical in this talk, but I thought I might set up on a really basic level how clay and glaze relate compositionally. Uh, clay bodies are, as I'm sure you all know, are made up of clays, fluxes, and fillers. Um, we may or may not need the fillers, so I grade that out, and we usually didn't use them in our recipes, so, um, so that's also why it's grade. And glazes um, are made up of basically um, clay, what makes up clay, alumina and silica, usually with extra silica, and fluxes. And so I've simplified it here just to make the comparison to clay and flux. And uh, the glass form I'm kind of folding into the category of clay here. Uh, the main difference is that clay bodies have a, a high amount of clay and a lower amount of flux, and glazes are the opposite, with a higher amount of flux and a lower amount of clay. Um, and again, the extra glass former. So they basically contain the same ingredients, um, but in uh, wildly different amounts. Uh, so uh, what we wanted to do is look at this uh, zone in between the two, uh, varying the proportion of clay to flux in the, uh, in the middle zone, which is also often termed the fault zone. Um, the so-called faults like uh, crawling, pinholing, and even running, the kind of stuff that I find really interesting. Um, and while these results are generally undesirable for utilitarian ceramics, hence the term fault, I thought these material behaviors could be of interest for sculpture. Um, what we were searching for was uh, clay bodies that would soften, deform, start to melt, and even become shiny, like glaze. And with the, from the glaze side, we wanted uh, the materials to take form, move, drip, bubble, and thicken into texture. So here's a brief overview of the project. Um, the work proceeded by reformulating clays with more glaze materials to encourage their movement, and conversely by adding clay components to glaze in order to help them take shape. We began by testing uh, blends of fluxing materials to gauge their melting range, and then proceeded to blend together existing recipes of clay and glaze. We modified these blends to achieve a balance between workability and meltability. Starting broad and then narrowing, we mixed and altered recipes in increments that were quick and easy to do in the glaze lab through volumetric blending rather than a lot of weighing out of materials. This was a good way to initially obtain quick results that allowed us to see trends and characteristics that we further wanted to develop. The fast results fostered enthusiasm for further testing and accelerated progress. We made choices based on various qualities of the results and the desirability and feasibility of using them for both my work and for the students' work. So there was really a, a quite specific lens that we were looking through in terms of choosing the materials that we really wanted to further uh, develop. <clears throat> 
So uh, the project had five main areas of investigation based on these interests. And the first one was flux blends. We, we kind of started off very broad, um, testing out various fluxes. And what we thought was be kind of a systematic testing of feldspars and fritz in combinations to see how they melted at cone six and cone nine and use them uh, directly as surfaces. We thought these melt tests would serve as a guide to adjust melt levels. As materials, they were not really very easy to manipulate. As surfaces, they fired into blotchy blobs. They were, for, they were the first indication to us that our testing format, um, in terms of how we set up the test, not only influences the results, but how we think about using a particular material. Um, and I'll talk about more of that um, in a bit. So feldspars, as you um, most likely know, have all of the elements of glaze, uh, alumina, silica, and flux in a natural combination, uh, glaze that melts at high temperature. And frit is a man-made combination of these same ingredients that melt at a specific temperature, usually lower. And so we added frit into the feldspars to lower the melting temperature and studied its behavior. Um, and we made a lot of these tests, um, many more than this, um, about 10 times as many. Um, and this was a, uh, not a, a completely failed direction, but these materials were not directly uh, segueing into our work. There weren't any materials that we could use kind of right away out of this. So um, we started to take the information from these tests and mix them into clay bodies. So there was a desire to look at some historical clay bodies like hard paste, uh, porcelain, perian, and belik porcelains because we hadn't worked with them before and were just intrigued by them. So we took this occasion to try them out. And um, I'm gonna just uh, mention that in the next slide, this was some of those flux blends that we applied to another form um, just to try to use them as a surface. But as you can see, they're, uh, they're crazing a lot. And, um, and getting a bit blotchy. So with these, uh, with these clay tests, we started doing some kind of general, looking at some general territory by making line blends. So at the end of these two um, uh, 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 Sorry. Um, at the ends are, are usually 100%. I think I might be slightly uh, uh, behind myself. Here we go. At the ends of these uh, um, line blends is 100%, and then the materials mixing in between are combinations of um, 75, 25, 50, 50, and 25, 50. So we could see um, as we mixed in the fluxes that, that we were starting to get some action at around 50% of the flux. And so we did lots of tests uh, with these to see um, what, how various um, fluxes reacted with the various clay bodies. And this was a really fast and quick way to get some information just by making a ball and squishing it down and uh, firing it up. Because in fact, testing takes up a lot of time. And we were finding we really wanted to get to making some work. So we didn't want to spend all of the time in preparing the tests. So um, we then took those quick tests and decided to also test the workability. So this was the next kind of form of test that we developed, which was to roll a ball and then roll a coil and to wrap that coil around the ball to see how um, basically workable the materials were and how much uh, plasticity they had. Because as we added the flux ingredients into these combinations, of clay bodies, we were reducing their plasticity. The only plastic material in these uh, material combinations is clay. So when you reduce the amount of clay, your material becomes instantly less workable. So we had to find this kind of balance between workability and a surface that seemed desirable. Because we were losing uh, workability, we decided to start casting some of these uh, materials because uh, casting bodies don't really require much plasticity. So we turned some of these uh, flux bodies into uh, casting slips. And we did some line blends with those uh, casting slips as well. And the results of these tests uh, revealed a little bit more in the different shapes and how different uh, forms were responding to gravity in the kiln. There were some uh, 
interesting discoveries by using different shapes and the way that um, a concave or a convex form would react with the materials. And then as the casting slip was diluted, because there was a large amount of flux in the ingredients, that flux would actually start settling out in the casting process. And that flux would migrate to the interior of the form and so that the interior actually had a quite different surface naturally than the exterior did. It's something like the settling of uh, heavy particles and light particles. So the interiors of these cast forms look like this with a glassy coating on the inside um, with certain fluxes and they would bubble up and um, also become somewhat uh, translucent. There was some, also some gentle uh, reforming of the forms. So we were casting these geometric forms so that we could see the way that the lines and the geometry would, um, would move and be able to, to gauge just how much movement was happening in them. So this is a cross section of one of those casts. Um, one of the problems uh, with these uh, bodies is that they do have a high glassy content and they need a kind of slow cooling of the kiln in, in order to uh, anneal that glassy content and so that they don't crack. But this was useful to be able to see that there's this uh, kind of very uh, thin layer on the interior there of, uh, of a different uh, smoother um, surface. Some of these uh, flux bodies would uh, bubble up and make these kind of interesting textures on the surface. And some of them would uh, burst at the seams and some of that flux would uh, slowly ooze out um, and become a different, uh, different aspect of the surface. And I've got a few of the, uh, samples of these materials up on the table at the end of the talk if you want to come up and look at some of them uh, live. Also, some of the surfaces created this uh, uh, textured uh, kind of um, fabric-like quality, even though um, they, they have a, a hard porcelain surface. And here's what uh, some of that um, slow cooling would, um, would change. Some of those fluxes were also mixed into, um, into glazes in small amounts. Um, and this was a technique that uh, Elliot Kaiser developed. And we used then the full range of the fluxes that we had tested to melt at various temperatures and made them into uh, small components that could then be mixed into other clay bodies. So this was that process of taking those flux blends that I first showed you, drying it out on plaster, uh, rolling it into small um, quantities, and then bisking it to a very low temperature to 018, so it was just solid enough, but not too hard that it couldn't be adjusted, and mixing that into existing uh, porcelain uh, bodies. The different size of the of the granule would influence the different size of the of the bubble that would uh, appear, and so there could be kind of larger pearls or smaller pearls. And then, if there was a high feldspar content, these would be a kind of uh, a pearl that would bubble out. If there was a high frit content, then they would kind of sink into the surface. So there was a kind of variation um, that could be uh, achieved this way. So the next thing that we tried to get a little bit more of a, a, a clay body, excuse me, that we didn't necessarily need to cast, but we, that we could actually work with, was to mix glaze recipes in with clay body recipes, rather than simply adding flux. Doing this adds a bit more clay into the recipe, but more importantly, perhaps, um, it adds a combination of materials that are already formulated to melt at a particular temperature. So a clay body that's cone six and a glaze that's cone six mixed together were giving us some uh, good results. So we were searching for this more workable mixture and this seemed to do the trick um, by uh, enabling more plastic qualities of clay to come into the combination. So we made simple sticks, um, rolling uh, coils to see if they would break or if they would stay together. And our first inclination was to fire them uh, upright. 
and uh, another technique that we used for kind of keeping track of all of these results was to take a picture and then take notes on that picture right away when the, when the results would come out of the kiln. And keeping track of all these tests was really a, a huge challenge, so this was useful. Um, but this type of test didn't give us too much information. All of the results seemed to look almost the same. So uh, another test was developed to drape the coil across uh, two, um, two protruding uh, parts of the, of the test tile. And this gave us quite a bit more information than, fi than uh, firing it upright. We were able to see if the the glaze, uh, the glaze body would actually move without breaking or if it would melt completely. And here's a range of those tests at both uh, cone six and cone 10. So we tried both matte and glossy glazes and the matte glazes um, really had relatively no effect on the surface of the uh, glaze bodies, but the glossy glazes that we mixed in had some of the effects that we were hoping for, softening, fluxing, and moving the clay bodies. Some of the matte glazes, we got a bit of a uh, nice icy uh, white surface, but they were also uh, chalky, which could be desirable in some cases. So with the glossy glazes, uh, movement began to happen at a ratio of 30% uh, glaze to 70% clay. Uh, and then it completely deformed when we got to 60% glaze. So there's a range between 30 to 60% glaze mixed in with a clay body where some movement begins to happen and things start to get interesting. These uh, pieces were samples of these uh, sticks that we made of the glaze bodies of varying amounts mixed together so that some of the glaze, uh, glaze bodies were more melty and holding the structure together and some of them were more um, stiff and giving a little bit more structure. While we didn't begin with glaze calculation, we did put the new material combinations into hyperglaze and took a look at the alumina silica ratios to see uh, where these were following in terms of uh, glazes. Most of the glaze bodies were falling just on the edge of a matte and a satin glaze in terms of this ratio. So while we had started with mixing clay bodies and glazes together, it might also be interesting, uh, an interesting direction just to start with one of those glazes, like a satin glaze, and try to make a glaze body out of it. Um, we did uh, also cast these glaze bodies to see how they kind of morphed on a larger scale. And as combinations of clays and glazes, they were so much better to handle and cast than the flux blends or simply blending extra flux into a clay body. Somehow this, uh, this combination of glaze and clays uh, was a kind of magic combination that was able to work really usefully for us. And so here you could see one um, that is uh, a very high percentage of clay and the other that has uh, more of a percentage, I think this is about 40% or 50% glaze. Uh, some of these works were made into a larger piece and this is the piece as it's going into the kiln and this is the piece as it's coming out of the kiln and you can see the way the uh, clay, uh, glaze body is kind of gently um, moving and these pieces are at a show in St. Paul right now, and they're at the uh, St. Paul Academy in the Oiko Systems show, if you get a chance to get out there and take a look at them in person. Here's one more. Are we almost out of time? I think we four or five minutes. Um, another area of investigation was fused silica. And so this was um, mixing high amounts of silica uh, into, uh, into the glazes. This was starting off with uh, high amounts of flux and then um, increasing amounts of silica gave us a stiffer melt. And too much silica though, um, in fact, uh, would result in a very brittle uh, surface. So we actually mixed porcelain back into these glazes as well and were able to get um, a glaze that could build up uh, on a sprayed surface. This is a page from the website so you can kind of see how the information is uh, listed on the website and there's various tests and results and um, you can refer to the um, 
the website uh, for all the information that I've presented today as well and, um, and even more. One more area was dry glaze bodies, and this was uh, glazes that involved a high amount of alumina rather than silica. We found these glazes using Ian Curry's grid method, which is uh, a very useful method of taking a glaze and um, stretching it to extremes of, um, this is a diagram of high amounts of alumina, high amounts of silica, and high amounts of flux. And you only need to mix four glazes in this method, and then volumetrically, all of the other 30, uh, 31 combinations of the glaze are mixed very quickly. And those tests resulted in um, some clay bodies that are very dry and chalky, but not brittle. So they have the appearance of being very dry, but they did hold together well. And I put up this slide so you can see that when they're used as surfaces, they look rather ordinary, like glaze, but they can actually be formed into uh, volumetric and dimensional forms. So. Um, as surfaces, some of them tended to shiver off, uh, off of the surface, which might also be a really interesting way to generate sur very thin surfaces, is to fire these glazes and then to peel them off as, um, as a form. These glazes in particular took color really well, so there's some really beautiful um, and brilliant colors. The last category is slow moving glazes, and these are glazes uh, that actually take on a bit of form uh, in themselves. They do adhere to a surface, but they also have their own dimensionality. And so we modified Ian Curry's grid test to show the way that these glazes could melt and move. And as surfaces, they adhere, but they don't really hold their own shape. So these were our three final ways of testing uh, glaze bodies and clay bodies, was to press mold it into a rectangle, to form a coil into a little rainbow, and to stretch it, uh, to roll it out into a flat slab and stretch it uh, across uh, two protruding uh, forms so that we could see the various ways that it behaves. Inventing test tiles ended up being a really important part of this project. So uh, this is one more version of those uh, uh, moving glazes. And then these are uh, the, way, the range of those uh, tests as they came out of the kiln. And this is how they appear on the website. So you can see as you uh, increase materials or decrease materials, the, the changes that happen. One final test was to um, use the U shape to see the way that these materials would wrap around and, and kind of create uh, another um, form themselves as glazes dripping in the kiln. So the project was made possible by all of these alchemists um, that helped um, and uh, also did uh, work as part of these, the course that developed from this project called Materiality, and we've created a couple of cookbooks uh, from this course that will most likely be linked with the, with the project on the website. What we've also learned is it's, it can be really difficult to repeat results twice. Maybe you've learned that too. I have a friend who said there's, there's no such thing as a glaze test because you never really can repeat those uh, conditions twice. So what we've started to strategize, and this is the work of one of those alchemists, uh, Marcus, who's here today, um, was to think about making work that actually incorporates the testing process into the piece so that those um, tests become the work itself. So here's the website, um, it's hotalchemy.ca, and thanks so much for coming today. Thank you.